So I have just been in Thailand up until, a, well, barely more than a month ago. So I'm still in culture shock being back in the UK. I think it's now nearly 10 years since I was in Oxford and nine years since I've been in the UK. But it's nice to be back and thanks for inviting me, Richard. I just heard Richard explaining the, the word Ur, the German word Ur, which means origin. And apparently it comes from the Mesopotamian city of Ur, which I never knew. Richard was giving an eloquent lecture on this just before the, I started, he introduced me. But just to explain what the, the title is, actually what I really want to say and get to at the end of this is not really the Ur text, but the Ur manuscript, by which I mean a physical thing, which all copies of the Tipitaka, as far as I've been able to establish, must go back to. Um, that's not quite the same thing as saying they have the same text, but they do, obviously, but they all must go back to a single physical manuscript, or obviously many manuscripts, the Tipitaka is so large. And we can tell this because of mistakes, very interesting and peculiar mistakes which have been transmitted faithfully. can only have happened with a single manuscript at the beginning. So, um, I have started to do the manuscript work based upon my time in the Dhammakaya temple, which I, I joined in 2012, so I was there nearly four years. So these are just a few facts about the, the project. Um, there are lots of editions of Pali texts, um, very good editions, the Burmese Chattasangayana, the PTS editions, there is editions in there are editions in Laos, in Sri Lanka, in Cambodia. I mean, you can, there are many, more than a dozen, I suppose. But not one of them has really looked at the manuscript tradition in any depth. I, I suppose the Chattasangayana has, the Burmese edition has the most. And I think they've been made some critical decisions. But of course, they never tell you what they are. And they hardly have consulted anything more than a few Burmese manuscripts. So what the project has been doing, what they've been doing in Thailand, is looking at the entire manuscript tradition, which is quite a, a large task. So the founder is this monk here, Venerable Tanavudo. He is a director of the, I think, the education part of the Dhammakaya Temple. The Dhammakaya Temple is quite a huge place, actually. Um, but he is a leading figure of the temple, and a very inspiring person with good ideas. So they, yeah, I joined the project, I think by that time in early 2012, they had some idea of what it would take and how long it could be. And of course, every year since I've worked there, they've increased the estimate of the years it would take to edit the Tipitaka. And now we just hope to get it done within our lifetime. So it's a huge task. Here are some of the staff members in front of the Damachai Institute, which is the research faculty I've been working at in the grounds of the temple. I mean, I say there are over 100 staff members. We have reading teams, manuscript reading teams in Burma, in Cambodia, and in Sri Lanka. So they deal with Pali manuscripts in those, uh, those scripts. So the, the team is growing all the time. It's much more than 100 now. At the, the Damachai Institute itself, we have a library, we have a fully funded research faculty, we have an IT team, we have a permanent scholar staff made up mainly of monks and a few laymen from Burma and Thailand. And obviously there are lots of monks and lay people from Thailand who are members of the temple. They are mostly, most of the work has consisted of them. So far there has been one publication which is a pilot volume of volume one of the Diga Nikaya, the Sila Kanda. Um, we expected to have finished the Diga Nikaya completely this year, but we have been delayed by IT problems. I think those problems have been resolved. Just about when I left last month, they have been resolved, and they have started re-editing, or they've started editing work on volume two of the Diga Nikaya. I think the Deegan Nikaya should be finished by next year. I hope it will be. So, yeah, 2016, we should, if not published actually, then the work will have been done and mostly ready to be published. 
after that I expect it to start quickening because the IT platforms and um, the whole entire approach to the project is fairly well settled, the methodology, how we deal with the manuscripts. So we've made lots of advances in that. So now we think maybe 30 years we can do to Pitaka. We're looking at 45 volumes. Um, at the same time, they want to publish a volume, um, sorry, a journal, which will come out every year. Whether that will be possible, I don't know. But that is the aim, at least. Okay. Uh, the, the images are a bit narrow, but you can at least make out some of what is here. These are just samples of the different... We're working with five... There are five regional traditions of Pali. So here is just a sample of a manuscript from each. In the top left is a Sinhalese manuscript, which is not clear at all. And then top right is a Burmese manuscript. Underneath the Burmese manuscript is a Com manuscript. And underneath the Sinhalese manuscript here, this is a Mon manuscript. The Mon tradition is is lying somewhere between the Burmese and this tradition, which is a northern Thai Pali tradition. This is a Tam manuscript. And this is actually the oldest, man this is the first page of the oldest manuscript we have so far gained access to, which is um, a copy of the Yamaka. So the Abhidhamma, book six, this is the, Yam the, the first page and of course, it's, on, it's, it's identical to what you will find in the PTS edition. So we have, um, we, with the Burmese manuscripts, we have been given good access to the libraries in Yangon and an old temple in Mandalay. With the, the Thai manuscripts, so the Com is from central Thailand, and most of these that we've consulted are kept in the National Library in Bangkok. The Tan manuscripts we have got from Laos and northern Thailand. The major temple in the north is Wat Sung Men. Um, there are a couple of other temples with older manuscripts, but not as wide, uh, not as big a collection as Wat Sung Men. Of course, the, the Tan tradition, um, I think it goes back... Um, the old northern... Thai tradition was more or less decimated when the Burmese invaded in the late medieval period and most of that tradition sort of dripped into other temples sort of in the north but mainly it seems that it went to Laos so there's a process of manuscripts travelling down from the north and then into Laos so they are the traditions we deal with, and we have a digital library now of maybe over 5,000 manuscripts. I mean, for the Sila Kandavaga, the Iginikaya 1, we had over 100 manuscripts. So our problem is that we have too many manuscripts. We can only really, to make a critical edition, we need to narrow that down to the 20 best manuscripts we can identify. So the problem with Theravada Buddhism, dealing with the manuscript tradition, is we have too many. In any other aspect of Indic Buddhism, the problem is we don't have enough manuscripts. Here is a selection of the problems that we've been trying to deal with. Firstly, there really is not a history of Theravada Buddhism. We know certain things about where Buddhism was, but we don't really know what they were doing, what they were thinking. We have maybe inscriptions, we know maybe there are land grants that we have records of, but the scribal tradition, the traditions of Pali learning, we really don't know very much. Uh, for example, the, the oldest Pali grammar is the grammar of Kachayana, and this seems to have been, seems to have been a work, I think, of the South Indian Theravada tradition, possibly a North Indian Theravada tradition. It's not from Sri Lanka anyway. And nothing is known about the Theravada tradition in India. It disappeared. So that is the problem, the first problem. We're dealing with manuscripts. We don't know where they go back to, roughly. We, of course, we have the, the tradition of 
Sri Lanka. Some, we have chronicles that record facts, but we don't know when manuscripts were transmitted, but when they were moved, what their history is. We don't know how the regional traditions of Pali are related. Now, obviously, the Burmese, the Tam, and the Kom, all the, the four Southeast Asian traditions are very closely related, but they are different. And there are, in structural terms, are quite telling differences between all four and the Sinhalese tradition. We have no idea what that means at the moment. As I mentioned, there are, we have too many manuscripts, actually. In the end, this will prove um, worthwhile, because we have such a rich collection, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Pali manuscripts. If we can actually have enough manpower to, to read them, we will learn lots. Now, with making a critical edition, there's the practical problem is there is just too much variation. Even if we narrow down and select the best manuscripts, in any edition, any, any critical edition, any individual book, we use 20 manuscripts, well, there are too many variants. It would be impossible to have more than one line per page of Pali text if you wanted to record every variant. And most of that variation is not important. It's small, insignificant scribal practices which don't really have any historical worth. More difficult is the fact that Pali is flexible. It is not like Sanskrit. There are many possibilities in the different forms of words, um, the different representations of Sandhi. There are many different possibilities. And of course, when you get into Middle Indic philology, well, you can derive words from different roots, and it's, you know, there might be three or four plausible variants, and there is little to choose, even, nothing even, between them. A more fundamental problem, we are originally going back to an oral tradition. So what can a critical edition be if you, the scribal tradition at some point was committed to manuscripts, committed to words on paper? So how does that affect what we're doing? What text are we trying to get back to? Can we get back to the first recitation of the first council? That is probably impossible. So what is a critical edition? These questions just haven't really been asked because it's been impossible so far to do a critical edition of a Pali text. The manuscripts are so far in such regions of the world that are so far apart that it's impossible to get them. It's a huge practical problem. So anyway, for the last few years we've been sending digitization teams out to temples in all the different Theravada countries and we have a huge collection now. So how we tackle these problems with regard to the different Pali traditions we will just have to write history as we study the manuscripts. As we study say a hundred manuscripts of the Diga Nikaya volume one we take samples, we take selections, and we look at every reading, and we see what the relationship is. So that is work in progress. We will have to do that ourselves. So we're planning to have a journal. We're also planning to have companion volumes in which we will include things like stemmas, relationship, analyses of um, philologically difficult points. That will all go in there. So the relationship between the Pali traditions will emerge, I think, in the course of the project. It will keep deepening uh, as we study more. I think, anyway, it's not really been up until recently that people have studied the Thai traditions seriously and taken them seriously as maybe the Thai traditions of Pali learning are not just derivative of Sinhalese or Burmese Pali traditions. The practical problems is how to select manuscripts. And even if you can select manuscripts, there is too much variation. Then the practical problem of dealing, 
putting variation into a critical apparatus, there's just too much. You have to make practical decisions about what is a valuable variance and what is not. It's just a matter of judgment. So what we've been doing, and this is something we had really no idea what to do with this at the moment. You know, you have 120 Digi Nikaya 2 manuscripts. How on earth can you choose them? So what we started doing was taking samples. We would go through the Chathasangayana, which luckily has good footnotes. And wherever the Burmese tradition has recorded variants, they have put them in the footnotes. It's easier to see in the printed edition because they actually have them as footnotes, but I think even the electronic version, they, they put them in. So we look at the footnotes, the variants, and wherever we find something interesting, we will take that paragraph and look at it in every manuscript. So we take it samples like that. We look at the udanas. So at the end of any, individ any section in any Pali work, they have a list of titles. Mm -hmm which have lots of interesting differences and you can usually work out relationships like that. Then we look at sort of titles and also payala sections. So when we work through all of this, all of these different ways of looking at the manuscripts for every manuscript in any particular book, by doing that we can see which is, uh, you know, which has been preserved the best, what the relationship is roughly between them, and we can start to build a family tree. And so far we've been doing this just by analysis alone, but we're starting to use computer programs to help us now. I think that is something which is, in the digital humanities, is becoming more common. But we will only use that as an aid to what we do manually. Now, I think this project, this type of work, would not be possible if we were just doing a printed text. In the days of just the pre-electronic, pre-internet days, this project would not be possible. Because it will only work if we can put all readings from all manuscripts in a synoptic text, which will be online. So you can see everything. Otherwise, you, it would be impossible to make a decision about what is a very, a very valuable reading and what is not. Since we know that we can just put everything online, in an easy to use format, then that allows us to be, you know, a bit adventurous in what we want to put into the uh, critical apparatus. So, the, okay, we will have printed books, but the online side, the e-text side of the project will be quite large. You'll be able to access all the manuscripts, synoptic readings, with lots of analysis as well. Okay, finally, we have an editorial policy, which is not... I don't think this sort of thing exists in Pali studies yet, but we have had to make one, because nobody has had to read so many different manuscripts of the same book. We don't normalize um, differences according to Sanskrit grammar. We try and pick authentic Middle Indic forms where they exist, if there is complete agreement, then we will allow whatever the manuscripts have, we will allow that in. We don't regularize what is in the manuscripts. Oh, this is strange. What's happening here? Okay. Okay, there it all is. Just to give you some examples of how we, the editorial policy works, so it's a, it's a system of preferences. We prefer Middle Indic forms. And obviously if there are two different Middle Indic forms, then we have to make a decision. When we have a whole series of rules about how to do that, mainly for things that don't matter too much. Especially what I, in Pali, what I would call Middle Indic Sandhi is really it's just a scribal thing. It's scri it reflects the scribal practices which probably have emerged by the time of Buddha Gosa. Whether you use Anuswara or the class nasal doesn't matter philologically. But since there's this difference and we have to have some sort of system, and I don't think we should follow the rules of Sanskrit, 
then we try and follow a system of preferences where we prefer a non-Sanskrit form if there is one. I just this is um, from the Golden Pali text, which probably dates to the late fourth century, early fifth century. It was found in Burma. I'll talk about it a bit more, but the ligature here is an unusual Middle Indic form, but it is a Middle Indic form. In Sanskrit, you would have an Anuswara. You have the N above and the T below. That sort of thing we will allow. It's irregular by Sanskrit standards, but this isn't Sanskrit. And of course, if we have... In Pali is flexible, so you can have many words which are taken directly from Sanskrit as well as Middle Indic forms. Mm -hmm. We leave the Sanskrit in if all the manuscripts have them. But if, if not, we would prefer to read a Middle Indic form. At the bottom, these are just um, readings we have which, according to the law of Moray, the correct form should be with the short vowel. And act when you look at the manuscripts, you find consistently maybe in the Thai tradition, that they will generally read correct Middle Indic forms. Looks like the Burmese and Sinhalese traditions are being Sanskritized much more. So the Thai traditions have been not really been messed with so much. So anyway, that's the general approach. We want to, we don't want to kind of um, put the manuscripts into some type of grammatical straitjacket. We just want to let there be variation. It means that it's not going to be 100% consistent. The Pali is not like that. It's a flexible language. This is a more tricky problem. What are we doing trying to do a critical edition? How can you make a critical edition of what was an oral tradition in the beginning? So what we are decided to do is go try and get back to the text of Buddha Gosa, which would mean roughly the 5th century AD. And we actually have inscriptions of Pali texts from this time. So we know the, the Tipitaka was grammatically in the form it is now by the time of Buddha Gosa. We have the commentaries of Buddha Gosa to help us. If you try to go back before Buddha goes, so there are too many variables, too many unknowns. I think um, scribal practice was developing from the writing down of the canon in the first century BC, probably up until and beyond Buddha goes. Mm. So this period of, is a period of flux. Some people have come and said, well, why don't you try and go back and get the text as it was written down in the first century BC? but it's still unknown exactly if that old Pali would resemble what we have now. It's a shame Rance Cousins isn't here, because I've talked to him a lot about this. He published in the Journal of the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies a very interesting, I think, um, original article on Pali. He distinguished between old and classical Pali. Old Pali would be the language in which the text was written down, in the first century BC, which would just resemble the inscriptional Prakrit in use in India at that time. And then Pali has been partially Sanskritized, as most Prakrits were, inscriptional Prakrits were. So it's not clear exactly what form the Tipitaka would be in at that time. But, okay, around about the fourth century, the fifth century, in Southeast Asia, we start to get inscriptions, and we can see exactly what it was like. And because we have Buddha Gosa from this time, that seems to be a suitable point at which to begin. I think, most likely, the text that we will establish critically, you can take it back a few hundred years. In rough, you would be able to find manuscripts, which would be roughly like what we're going to end up with. Uh, but that's just because the tradition is so strong. The further you go back, there will be more and more variation and small, small differences. But this is, I, I think, probably because everybody is very sceptical these days, the problem of, since the Pali manuscripts are really very recent, 
the skeptical objection will arise is that how can you say that this goes back to Buddhaghosa if a manuscript is only from the 18th century so we do have to consider the, the skeptic so the, this is a Google map and where the symbol is here marking that was where the golden Pali text was found the German epigrapher Harry Falk has done lots of work on this text and he dates it to the the 4th or early 5th century AD he said it in the I think the, the script and the copper plates on which it's laid out with three lines it resembles <coughs> a land grants, copper land grants from South India of that period very closely so he's, he's narrowed down the, the dates quite significantly so this is an interesting find and very useful for Pali studies this just shows the you can see the old city walls of Sri Kshetra the Burmese kingdom and the stupa is here the brick stupa and this is the reliquary in which the text was found and here we have a couple of gold leaves I mean it's a very elaborate a lot of time and money must have gone into making this the Pali tradition must have been receiving significant support the script is a South Indian Brahmi script of the 4th century roughly and um, these pages here contain the final section of the Vesar Rajasutta is in the 4th book of the, of the Anguttara Nikaya we'll look at a bit more of that in a minute so I just it's interesting to see this as a material object you can put the Pali tradition in a certain place receiving significant support and with Pali in exactly the same form as we have now in the manuscripts moving into central Thailand well in the Thai area this is a map which is from a a publication that has just come out in Thailand called Af no, Before Siam my friend Nicholas Revere is a French archaeologist working in Thailand and this is from the book it shows inscriptions in, from early medieval Thailand the red which these red dots they mark Pali inscriptions to the northeast, which is now the, the Isan area, it is a mixture of Sanskrit and Khmer, which would reflect the fact that it was probably under the control of the Khmer Empire. I don't think enough people know the, this, this fact that the Pali tradition is very well represented in mainland Southeast Asia in the early medieval period. There are lots of inscriptions all in the old southern Brahmi script you don't really get Pali inscriptions further east than this and the Pali tradition of Cambodia is really a late medieval thing a late medieval development there is some evidence for it in medieval period but the um, the Khmer region is mainly seems to have been a Sanskritic Shaiva culture with bits of Vajrayana Buddhism maybe bits of Vaishnavism but hardly any Pali so apart from the golden Pali text in Lower Burma you have significant support for the Pali tradition in early medieval Thailand the central region <coughs> according to Harry Falk the golden Pali text <coughs> is in a southern Indian Brahmi script it isn't in a Sri Lankan Brahmi script of that period the difference is rather small but I bow down to his superior judgment it means the Pali tradition in Southeast Asia comes from India it doesn't come from Sri Lanka originally actual evidence for Sinhalese Theravada is from I think the 11th or 12th century 
where you have inscriptions mentioning the Siha Vagangsa as a particular monastic lineage. Before then, there is really is not much. An inscription has been discovered in the, I think, central northeast Thailand, which has some fragments of the Telakataha Gata, which if that has that could have come from Sri Lanka in about the eighth or ninth century. So there must have been contact in the early medieval period, but as a whole, the traditions have come from South India. Which means that all of these Pali manuscripts from Burma, Northern Thailand, Central Thailand, they're not coming from the Mahavihara of Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka. It's not Sri Lankan Theravada originally, or directly. Originally is more difficult to establish. Here is just a couple of pages of the Golden Pali text. And just starting, this is page 7 and 8, the bottom line of this page and the three lines of page 8 is the beginning of the Vesaraja Sutta. It's about page 9 in the PTS edition, volume 4. The Book of Four, sorry. <coughs> I think it's volume 2 in the PTS edition. But the Pali is identical, apart from a few minor phonetic differences. It's exactly the same as what you have. In this particular text, there are a few mistakes in the Golden Pali text when we compare it to modern printed editions. So one thing I would like to do as soon as I get enough manuscripts is compare this to the manuscripts and see if any of the manuscripts have this mistake. I imagine it, we will find some in Southeast Asia. Some manuscripts with the same, I think there's a small payala section which they have made a mistake on. But we can do those sort of things now. There are not many Pali inscriptions to work with, but there are at least some. But anyway, this is Pali tradition in the late 4th century. And even by this time, the tradition is just, it's well established, it's, it's what we have now. So if anybody is sceptical about our project, then you have me to deal with. Okay, now I just have a few more things to say. Of course, the Brahma Jala Sutta, the first text of the Silakanda, Diga Nikaya 1, this is something that we completely missed when we were doing the critical edition. We've done the pilot volume of, of Diga Nikaya 1, and we all missed something. And I bet you, Richard, all the times you must have looked, read the Brahma Jala Sutta, everybody has missed a, 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 a mistake. And it's very hard to spot because Pali is so repetitive. But when we looked then, when we, re we only realized the mistake because Venerable Analayo pointed it out. And he only realized it because he had been looking in the Chinese edition. And on this particular fact, the Chinese tradition had an extra little piece of text which we should have had in the Pali. But it, because the text, there were roughly about eight statements with minor differences between them and you, your mind boggles at the repetition the text is at the beginning of the sutta the Buddha is walking between Rajagaha and Nalanda following him is a Pari Bajaka Supiya and his Brahmin disciple Brahmadatta so the, the Guru is criticizing the Buddha and the Shishya, the disciple, is praising the Buddha. They're having this argument, following the Buddha and the bhikkhus. And then the bhikkhus report this to the Buddha, and he says, yeah, you know, okay, I know that this is happening, I'm not really bothered. So the Buddha then gives a teaching about not being bothered, where he says, first of all, if somebody criticizes the triple jewel, you should avoid any displeasure which might be incited by the critique. 
You should avoid it because it's an obstacle. It's an obstacle because it prevents correct understanding. And the correct attitude you should have, reject the false as the false. Don't be bothered, but see things as they are. This is just Buddhism. Then the section on the praise of the jewels, three jewels, when somebody praises the triple jewel, you should not be too delighted. You shouldn't be too delighted because it is an obstacle. Why is it an obstacle? At this point, the text is missing. It should be there, but it is missing, and it's in the Chinese. The text continues, reject the false as the false. Definitely a piece of text has been missed. Not That isn't very surprising, maybe. Any manuscript could make this mistake. Any scribe could make this mistake. Here is the Pali. And you see um, just how repetitive it is. If you just look at the beginning, every section is beginning the same. It's the same all the way through. This should here be, this should be, this should be repeated, but in a positive form, with somebody praising the Buddha. But it's an easy mistake to make. However, this is exactly the sort of mistake that will be made in a scribal tradition. It's harder to imagine it being an oral mistake when it's, a text is being chanted in a group. That could happen, maybe. And still, it's still not entirely clear when the mistake would happen. It's more likely that it would have happened in a manuscript tradition. Mm -hmm. Because if you had all of these, say on a manuscript, you'd maybe you had about five or six lines, and every line you would have had the same formula. Your eye can easily run from one to the next. So I think it's much more likely to be a, a scribal error. But every manuscript has it. So every manuscript loses exactly the same text. So they all go back, they must go back to a single physical object where this mistake has been made. Maybe the mistake could have been made separately, but then you'd expect different types of mistake around this. Not exactly the same mistake. There should be at least some variation. So, then when Venerable Analeo told us this, and then we realized, ah, okay, should we restore this text? Probably not. It wasn't in the original. We will have some sort of footnote saying that something has been missed out. But historically, I think this is much more important. Now, even more, okay, even more difficult is something we find after the Samadhiti Sutta. <coughs> this is the ninth sutra of the Majjhima Nikaya. I have just given a couple of screen grabs of the Chattasangayana. This is the end of the Samarditi Sutta in the digital Pali reader, which you open up in, um, what is it, Mozilla Firefox. It's a very easy way to use Pali electronically because you can use the dictionary at the same time. They have the PTS dictionary in it. Anyway, that's, this is one version of the Chattasangayana, which is online. This is the Vipassana Research Institute version. Now, in the digital Pali reader, okay, it says here, Sanwa Diti Sutta Nikitam Navanam. And you have these variants. In the Chattasangayana, they give the variants. So this is something which was in all of the Burmese manuscript. And actually, um, they include it as a footnote in the printed edition. Now, there shouldn't be anything here. There definitely shouldn't be anything after the ninth sutta of any, any group of suttas. Maybe after the tenth, the final sutta, you get these udanas, which give sutta titles. But this is not an udana. I'm calling it a false udana. I don't know what to call it. It's an unidentified Pali text. Maybe you could set this as a Pali exam, Richard. I think <coughs> that would be very cruel. The 
So, okay, the Samar Ditti Sutta finishes, and then you have this, which is not anything to do with the Samar Ditti Sutta. Mm-hmm. It's not anything to do with anything. I've not been able to identify it. So we don't know where this comes from. It's not an Udana. It's some type of didactic text talking about certain, I think, certain items of dependent origination. It's probably some analytical, I don't know, exegetical work. It could be some sort of exegesis of the Samaditi Sutta, which is a very analytical text, but I haven't looked at it much yet. A few months ago, we had a workshop in the Dhammakaya Temple with Oscar von Hinuba, and we said, well, what do you think of this? And he couldn't make any head or tail of it, but then said, it's p- the only explanation he could think of is that an extra leaf from a different text has been mistakenly included in the Majjhima Nikaya, Volume 1, at some point. Because it's, not, it's an entirely different text. So this is the possibility. In the transmission of the Majjhima Nikaya, at least, an extra palm, single palm leaf folio has somehow been included in it by mistake. That's all we have so far. Maybe we can research this, because this actually exists in all of the Southeast Asian manuscripts. It's something which has been repeated and copied. It doesn't occur in the Sinhalese manuscripts. But there is something else just like this which occurs not only in the Southeast Asian manuscripts but also in the Sinhalese manuscripts. It's another false Udana occurring after the next Sutta which is the Maha, the Satipatthana Sutta. So the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, not the Maha I suppose, that is in the Dhyanakaya. The Satipatthana Sutta, the 10th Sutta of the Majjhima Volume 1 the final sutta of the first Vagga. Now, after the Vagga, you see, there should be an Udana. And the Udana is, is here. This is the Udana with the list of sutta titles for the first Vagga of the Majjhima Nikaya Volume 1. This is correct. This is correct. In between, we have an even more unidentifiable text. There are levels of unidentifiability. This makes... Again, it's a didactic text. Some of the vocabulary in these two unidentified pieces is commentarial, so it is not a part of the Tepitaka, definitely. It must be a type of exegesis. Maybe the Samarbiti Sutta, the Satipatthana Sutta, they're very analytical. Maybe there were Pali books explaining certain aspects. Anyway, they've been included in the Majjhima Nikaya transmission. So this, this is in both. This is in the Sinhalese and all of the Southeast Asian. I think if you add this text up to the, the previous text, I mean, you might be in, if you're dealing with a tradition with, say, five or less lines per leaf, it possibly would be one folio in total, although the two don't quite connect. So I'm not sure what this is still. But they're there. The first one, the the Samarditi Sutta extra piece, it's in all Southeast Asian manuscripts. No exception. This is in every manuscript. All manuscripts we have must go back to some mistaken physical volume which had extra folios in it by mistake. And for some reason, because the tradition probably is so conservative, they've not been taken out. Of course, the PTS uh, editors, they haven't included this, probably wisely. But the Burmese edition shows how conservative they are. This is still in the chapter Sangaina. Even though as a footnote, it is there. Okay, so every... Every Pali manuscript, at least of the Diga and Majjhima Nikayas, as far as we've looked at them, 
goes back to a single volume. Okay, you might say that's not very surprising. Um, but with this type of mistake, it is a bit strange. We must be dealing with some original monastic scribal tradition. A scribal tradition based in a monastery, which has, there, from there the, the Pali tradition has been diffused. So what is, what is the monastery? Okay, here are some conclusions. So the manuscripts, the Diga and Majima, I've looked at some Vinaya. Definitely um, the Vinaya looks as well the same, but they have some peculiarities. Um, in the Chulavaka, for example, there is an Udana that mentions the Sihala Deepa, it mentions the Mahavihara, Mahavihara Vasins in the actual Udana, which is in all Southeast Asian manuscripts. So probably most of the Tipitaka is going back to a single physical volume. Now each individual manuscript tradition, how can I say it, although it, they're all related, they do things a little bit differently. So where you get Midlindic variation, phonetic variation, especially with regard to Sandy and scribal, well, orthographic practices, each tradition has its own way of doing it. And this way of doing it is basically, according to the inscriptions, it was being worked out in the pre-medieval history of Indian Buddhism. I would have liked to analyze this word a bit more, but that would have been a bit dry, I suppose. Dibala, the reconstructed form, is actually from the abstract noun, the correct, in the, the correct grammar, it should be the abstract noun, dubala, from Dalbalia, which would be weakness. In the very earliest inscriptional form, that would be without geminated consonants. This would be going back to the Ashokan period, and at least until the first century BC. After the first century BC, they start trying to double the consonants and represent them properly. So we don't, in the manuscripts, we don't have that. But then we have a lot of attempts to get it right. And often they don't get it right. But they, they were trying to get it right at some point, and that would have been the period just before Budugosa, when the orthography of Prakrit was being Sanskritized. So if every individual manuscript tradition has different ways of working these issues out, it would look to me like the separation of the original manuscript must have happened before that. In other words, I'm, I think that this proves that, I think there will be a lot more evidence along these lines, the original manuscript is not some late medieval or pre-early modern manuscript that has just been disseminated in the Pali traditions because they were all defunct and in not a good state. That hasn't happened. It's much older. So I think it is all before Buddhaghosa. So the scribal error in the Brahmanjala, if the error in the Brahmanjala Sutta is a scribal error, then we're dealing with I mean, how far back can that go to the first writing down of the canon, which would have happened in the first century BC? How far back can this original text go before it was disseminated? That we don't know yet. All we can say it is it must be after the first century BC and before Buddhaghosa, before maybe the fourth century AD. So, um, a final point then is if it goes back to a single manuscript, well, where was this manuscript put together? Where is the source of the Pali tradition? Lance Cousins has recently said that it didn't happen in Sri Lanka. And he has cited commentaries with very plausible, realistic scenarios of, in the first century BC, when there was some catastrophe or some difficulties happened in Sri Lanka, a load of monks went to India and they came back with something. He thinks that maybe they came back with a written text. Now, I think there's a lot going through this theory. There must have been, I mean, the Pali tradition was Indian. 
I think the closest inscriptions that we get to Pali are things say at Bahut or Sanchi and of course Sanchi in the Sinhalese chronicles is where the tradition is meant to have come from or at least Mahinda he went he stopped over there Mm -hmm. the Pali tradition in Sri Lanka has connections to the northwest for a long time after this it gets texts like the Melinda Panya later on the early medieval period the grammatical tradition is basically Indian I think the latest work on that is that um, there is now a critical edition of Kachayana by Ole Pind and he is saying that this is an Indian Pali grammatical tradition if you look in Kachayana it cites lots of texts which you cannot find in any electric electronic search engine or even if, you know, if you've read widely in Pali Kachayana has lots of stuff which isn't there so I think there's a very good case for making the argument this original text was made in some monastic some important monastery in India was taken to Sri Lanka at the same time went probably down to South India and from there made its way to Southeast Asia the other scenario this is also possible is what the Sri Lankans say the, uh, the canon was written down in the 1st century BC in the Alu Vihara near Anuradhapura so that could also be the case the text could diffuse from there could spread in South India become a bit different in terms of its structure in South India and then go to Southeast Asia so these two these are the two scenarios but I think that the divergence must happen before Budugosa and anyway I was asking some of the Sri Lankans in the Dhammakaya temple on the scholar team the tradition states, states that the canon was written down in the Alu Vihara but who has ever read that in a Pali text do you know anything Richard no, none of them could say so where the Pali canon was written is I think it's, it's up for grabs to put it that way the Alu Vihara anyway is a tiny cave entirely unsuited to writing on palm leaves I think ok so these are I think I wanted to say something about the original text this is still at the beginning stage of the, uh, the Damachai Tapitika project but when we start looking at the manuscript the, the wider manuscript tradition which can only be done if you have over 100 people working on it otherwise you can't get the text and you can't read them all when, you, we, when we start looking at them there are lots of peculiar things which I think are extremely odd and as we go on we will learn a lot more ok, thank you